This is the story of four young musicians from Sweden who threatened Britain and America's stranglehold on popular music. They became famous for exposing their complicated love lives in brilliantly melodic modern pop songs. They are, of course, ABBA. My mother and father used to sing songs to me when I was very little. But I think the first music that really meant to, something to me personally was uh, when I first heard the skiffle music, which was when I was 11 or 12. And in fact, I started playing in a skiffle group at that time too. Good afternoon, I'm going to be very welcome to come to Folkets Park in the evening in Vestvik. And I'm here to present you Hot in Never go, play Those are the rules. Always be nice to me. Don't you let me down. Don't be like ice to me. Bjorn had already met ABBA's future manager, lyric writer Stig Anderson, who suggested the name The Hoop Nanny Singers, and by the mid 60s they were a successful Swedish folk act. Bjorn soon lost interest in folk music though, especially after meeting Benny Anderson, a member of Sweden's biggest pop group, the Hep Stars. I was brought up by my grandmother and she she was a good lady. You know. She was uh, took good care of me and uh, though she had to work hard to get the money to survive <laughs> but uh, I started to sing in dance band when I was 13 years old and after two years or one year I changed to a big band and together with them I sang for two years and after the split up with the big band I started my own band and the name of that band was Anifrid Four. <laughs> I met my uh, husband uh, in the big band. He was playing the trombone. And uh, we fell in love, you know. I was quite young, but I knew that I wanted to be together with him. So I got my son when I was 17 years only. And we got married when I was 18. And after four years, I got my daughter. <laughs> professionally in 62, 63, I think, with a band called the Hep Stars. Then I wrote a song called Sunny Girl for the Hep Stars. I think we had a hit with that in Holland. She's a sunny girl, Marie, and no one can declare that she's something that I never needed, never want to care for. She's a sunny girl, Marie. 
Benny's song was an exception to the Hepstar's usual wild R&B, which at one point put them in three out of the four top places in the Swedish chart. She's domestic, she's property, she's sweet like a reed. She's diverting, she is faithful, ain't that all you need? And I'm soaring like a feather in a world I've just created for a very simple reason that is one. She's mine. I wrote my own songs. I did uh, six Swedish solo LPs. LPs. in the group and uh, you know I have also been a lyric writer for them and uh, I was an, uh, an actor guitar player and I wrote my own songs back in the 50s um, I was uh, performing these in the what we call the Swedish folk parks open air theaters and that's really how I started I had a big hit in Holland called Rock and Billy oh, we met on tour. He was in a band too, and we was we were touring the uh, folk parks, places that you tour here in Sweden. Play during the summer, and uh, we just ran into each other. And uh, I knew that he wrote songs, and he knew that I wrote. So we just, you know, we happened to meet, and we sat down and played a little. And, I think we both thought that the other guy was quite, quite nice, you know. Maybe we could someday in the future be able to work together. Uh, I thought they were very talented as being writers, but I never thought of them from the very beginning as being artists as, as well. So I promised them already back in 68 that I thought that one day they could have an international break with their songs because they are very talented writers. Benny and Bjorn were recording an album of their own with all, uh, all the songs written by them. And uh, for one song they needed uh, a female choir. So it was very natural to ask Agneta and myself if we wanted to do that part. And so we did, and we thought it sounded very good. Yeah. And uh, then we decided maybe to try something in English. So Van and Bjorn wrote a song uh, with the English lyrics, and the title of that one is People Need Love. And that's how it started, actually. Yeah. <laughs> in the summer of 1971, Bjorn married Agneta, and the church organ was played by Benny, who by now was living with Frida. They had not yet adopted the name ABBA. And yet his daughter Linda was on the way when the quartet competed in the Swedish heats for the 1973 Eurovision Song Contest with the Benny and Bjorn song. The first thing that came on that I thought it was a new approach to the Eurovision Song Contest. It was a pop song. And I thought uh, it, the Eurovision Song uh, Contest needed something new. Italia. Well, Ring Ring wasn't what Europe had been waiting for, but ABBA and their manager only had to wait till the following year's contest for this new approach to pay off. No doubt about it, the winning song of the 1974 Eurovision Song Contest, La Chanson Gagnante, the Concours de la Eurovision Chanson... Concours... La Chanson Eurovision 1974, c'est Waterloo 
La Suède avec Waterloo, chanté par Abba. Sort of, you know, it was a kind of uh, marketing. And um, as you know, it was a good idea, I think. When you uh, are in a situation like that, you have to change a lot in your life to be able to, to take care of what's happening to you in the right way. It uh, gave us a lot of work <laughs> and a lot of traveling and uh, uh, a changing of, of my life um, uh, to be an offici official, if you say that, person. A famous person. ABBA found it hard to follow the success of Waterloo. Like so many Eurovision winners who disappeared soon after the contest, they re-released Ring Ring, but nothing happened until I Do, I Do, I Do, SOS and Mamma Mia, a British number one early in 76. So what had been the problem? That they were Swedes. I mean, the pop language is English. And of course, that was a big decision to take to just sing in English and launch them in English. That was the biggest problem we had. We start off with the music. We sit down with piano and guitar and uh, just, you know, play along for hours and hours, for days and weeks and months. And sooner or later, eventually, there, there's a song there and uh, a melody. Because at that stage, uh, the music, the sound of the whole thing tells you something, suggests a story. So that's where the lyrics come in and then the vocals. And then uh, a few more overdubs, if, if needed. And then it's mixed down, and then it's a record. Can you play a little bit? Come on, go down. I can hold your pek finger. Benny and Bjorn's songs, although very cleverly arranged, are built around superbly simple melodies, as they demonstrate here to the young winner of a Meet Abba competition. This song became another British number one in May 1976. There's absolutely no chance for gloom when they start to sing and play. <laughs> By now, ABBA knew all about living in a rich man's world after three consecutive number ones, Mamma Mia, Fernando, and Dancing Queen, which went on to top the American charts in early 1977. The public was becoming as fascinated with their finances as it was with their music.
we have decided long ago to stay in this country. As you know, Sweden is the most high-taxed country in the world. And so we have to invest the money instead of just giving it away as tax. That's the way it started the whole organization. But mainly other people are taking care of that for us. So it's not really the group ABBA making business. It's a rich man's world. It could be real estate. It could be bicycles. It could be oil. Uh, you mention it, anything, financing, leasing. We have lots of uh, interest in, in, uh, in all these fields. It's a rich man's world. Some documents from when we were in Australia, but it just grew bigger and bigger, and, and all of a sudden there was a Panavision movie for two hours with a little, little storyline to it. We had a little part in this Australian tour, or and European tour in 70. Seven, I think, where we wrote a little mini musical within the show, uh, The Girl with the Golden Hair, the two girls playing two different sides. In 1977, a German magazine article produced Frieda's first meeting with her then unknown father. Later that year, Agneta had her second child and so agreed to another world tour, though it did not happen for another two years. Deal. That's the situation is in America when, when it starts moving there, you know? Everybody moved from Holland or from England. The, all the bands artists, they, they move over to America and they work from out, out from there. That they are available all the time for everybody who wants them in person. And uh, we talked about that a couple of years ago, and I don't think that any of us was really prepared to do that again after having done exactly the same thing in Europe and other parts of the world. Benny and Frieda finally married in October 1978, but by Christmas Bjorn and Agneta had announced their divorce. Many predicted the end of the group, but ABBA proved strong enough to survive even the divorce of Benny and Frieda two years later. This was the response when a Dutch interviewer reminded Agneta of how a recent authorised book, ABBA for the Record, had suggested that she possessed the sexiest bottom in popular music. Yes. Where did it come from? Was it a journalist who said it? Well, it, it came from a journalist. From a the newspaper. Yes, from a newspaper after, yes. during we did our... Thank you. 
My favorite is the music comes above. So I don't know if if there is anything more to achieve. I mean, how will that be? Not by selling records, not by going on the road, I think. Not by writing uh, even better songs. Forever. I don't know. I think it's it's all it's sort of never started, never ended. You know. I, I would say that what I would like to achieve with that would be to make an even better album, which by our standards and by the audience's. Skiing. And you, Bjorn? What I do in my spare time? Yeah. Play around with the kids. Read. Prowl the streets. What do you uh, think? Boating in the summer. Uh, lots of things. Normal things that everybody yeah. does, you know, watching video, TV. Agneta? Mm, the same for me. I play a lot with the kids and uh, take uh, long walks in the, the wood with my big dog. What kind of dog? <laughs> I have a Leon Berger. Tell staying in the music business in the coming years? Yes, I think I have to. <laughs> I don't know anything else so much. Um, I feel very comfortable in this business and I think I... I With something else, you know, something, something new, something more. Uh, we have, in fact, had some discussions with Tim Rice in London about a possible collaboration. We don't know yet, but I hope uh, we'll be able to write a music.